Welcome to Frank's Diana Explains. Today's topic is the Cambridge Master's Degree in Advanced Computer Science, or equivalently, Part 3 of the Computer Science Tripos. What are they? Should you be doing them? How do you get into them? If you think you might want to do an extra year of Computer Science after your Bachelor of Arts degree, it's a good idea to think about these questions well ahead of the application deadline and hopefully this video will help you with that. I'm going to cover these points. What is the difference between Part 3 and the Master? Why should anyone do either of these? What do you actually do in it? And how is it different from your undergraduate degree? What should you expect to get out of it? And what do you need to do to get in? I hope you will find this video useful. If you do, like, subscribe and come back for more every Friday. If you have any questions about this video, ask me in the comments. So first of all, what is part three and how is it different from the master's degree in advanced computer science? Well, actually, they are almost the same. Both are uh, one year of preparation for research. And most of the coursework is shared between part three and the so-called ACS, Master in Advanced Computer Science. The differences between the two courses are primarily administrative. Who's eligible, when you graduate, exactly how long it lasts, and crucially how funding works. So if you do part three, you end up with an MEng, Master of Engineering degree. If you do the ACS, you end up with a, a MPhil. You can only do part three uh, if you did part two with us in Cambridge, whereas you can do the uh, Master in Advanced Computer Science if you come from outside. The Master in Advanced Computer Science is ever so slightly longer uh, and uh, aside from that they are broadly the same. There are, in gen generally speaking, there are about uh, three broad types of master's degree. Uh, you could have a specialization course, for example, you do, let's say a master in cyber security. Uh, that's something where you've already done some basic uh, groundwork in computer science in your BA and then the master's course is to make you a specialist in one subtopic. Uh, the second type of master's degree that exists is a kind of conversion course. So you've done some other stuff, uh, I don't know, some uh, other course, uh, let's say some natural science or uh, accounting or finance and, and so on, and you want to get uh, a grounding in computer science and this converts you to, from whatever it is that you had done before to a computer scientist. And then the third type uh, is a, a course where you've already got your mm, uh, groundwork in computer science done in your undergraduate course, and this prepares you for research, prepares you for doing a PhD. Now, in Cambridge, uh, at the moment, we don't really do the first type of this, which is a specialized master in some uh, particular subtopic. We used to do the second type, which was a conversion course. It was called the Diploma in Computer Science, but we don't do that anymore. And uh, our master that's currently on offer, the Master in Advanced Computer Science, is of the third type. It's something that, uh, okay, you've uh, studied the textbooks and now we are going to prepare you for research, for doing a PhD. And the part three that we also offer is a way for our current undergraduates to do broadly the same content, but uh, without graduating first, which uh, from an administrative viewpoint uh, usually makes it easier to find ways to pay for it. So uh, the second point I said I would want to cover is uh, why should you do uh, either the part three or the master in advanced computer science? Well, uh, as I said, primarily uh, you should be doing that uh, if you want to do research later. They are courses that prepare you for doing a PhD. And you might rightly ask, well, why, if the PhD is a course that teaches me how to do research, why should I do a course to prepare me uh, to do the PhD? That not it the point of the PhD to teach me how to do research? Well, uh, it's true, uh, but the PhD requires you to make an original contribution okay, to the field of scientific field that you're engaging in, in our case computer science, you have to create something new and original. Doing new stuff that 
nobody was able to do before okay and that's on the basis of that that you get uh, awarded a PhD you've done something that nobody could do uh, and you will try to do something that nobody could do and some of it won't work uh, that's the nature of research um, it's not the case that if you follow instructions you will end up with a degree so it's rather different from what you did at undergraduate level it is difficult it's one of the most significant milestones in your academic career it's qualitatively different from what you did before you know studied the textbook passed the exam learned the syllabus no 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 it's nothing of the sort because uh, it's stuff that we don't know if it's going to work and if it doesn't work as originally planned you have to figure out some other way to make it work and you have to do it in three years which very few people manage to do uh, when they get the total freedom of the PhD you don't have to go to courses do exams and so on uh, you're no longer clocked by these deadlines uh, that exist in the undergraduate course and it's very easy to just wander off and a very difficult to finish it in three years so it is quite helpful uh, to have this small stepping stone of a one-year master's course where we help you bridge the gap from the scripted undergraduate program to the unscripted PhD okay so we teach you some of the methods you will need to figure out to be a researcher um, we'll teach you how to assess if a piece of research that someone perhaps you perhaps someone else has done uh, is actually worth it um, and so on and um, additionally this year of a master's course is actually a chance for you to try before you buy as I like to put it um, in the sense that you may not be sure that you really want to do research the rest of your life and in this case before committing to investing the three years of a PhD you just invest one year uh, of uh, the master to see if that's what you really like uh, although I should also say that uh, from this viewpoint the pipelines to apply for a PhD are so long almost one year long that uh, this aspect doesn't work terribly well because you will have to put in a PhD application just uh, after a few months of having started the master you can't just go through one year of master and then decide if it's the thing for you uh, of course you can always you know put in the application uh, by the deadline the application for PhD while you're you have just started your master and then decide later mm, to withdraw it if it really wasn't the thing that you liked uh, but uh, instead if you find ah that's exactly the thing for me then it's already in and it's uh, it's been running anyway um, having mentioned that um, you might like or not like to do research it is a good idea to have a valid reason for wanting to do this master because there's actually a few too many people who uh, were good in their undergraduate they were getting good exam marks uh, and uh, who continue into a master basically on autopilot because uh, they're getting good results and staying at university se seems to be easier than going out into the real world and taking on the responsibilities of an adult and you know, getting a job and getting a house and you know, getting all the other stuff um, so staying in the master's course or further graduate studies uh, just as um, something you do because you're good at university uh, that tends not to end well uh, graduate studies are not a parking space and you should have a better reason for doing graduate studies than just you know you're doing well in the undergraduate might as well continue uh, while you win no uh, doing a master's course does not even guarantee you a higher salary our master as I said is a preparation for a PhD and it's a pretty useless degree to get if you don't want uh, to do a PhD later if you don't want a career in research if you do want to do a PhD a PhD it sounds very glamorous okay you have put doctor in front of your name but it's a pretty difficult thing to do and truth be told is generally not necessarily the route to a very high paying job in fact uh, 
many people without a PhD make uh, a lot more money than uh, people with a PhD. So you really need to enjoy research for its own sake uh, and enjoy research for other reasons than the financial reward. And uh, you need to be ready to endure the downsides of a career in research if you want to engage in it. So figure this one out. Is this truly what you want to do with your life uh, professionally? If not, it, it may be a waste of time to prepare for a PhD that is not going to be a fulfilling career path for you. However, as I said earlier, the part three or the master in, in ACS may be a deliberate investment of one year to understand if research is what you like to do for the rest of your life or not. And that, that in itself, I would say that's a pretty good reason for engaging in it. Now, with that said, if you are seriously passionate about devoting your career to research and you want to get a PhD eventually, then the Cambridge uh, Master in Advanced Computer Science or the part three will give you an excellent preparation for this career in research because you will be taught by world-class research leaders or my colleagues and you'll be treated specially by them, by us, because the best master students tend to become uh, great PhD students and what every professor wants, certainly what I want, is to work with excellent and creative and inventive PhD students, uh, train them, help them grow into capable researchers and uh, learn from them and invent and build something new together with them along the way. That's one of the most satisfying things of the job I do. So uh, this is why people like me will greatly value people who are uh, in this master's course or part three because they are a promise of something good that might happen later. The third point I said I wanted to cover is what you actually do uh, while you are doing part three or the master and how is it different from the undergraduate course that you would have done before that. Well you will have uh, courses uh, modules during this uh, master on specialized topics that's similar to what you do in the final year of your undergraduate uh, but slightly more advanced it's the stuff your professor does for research for example uh, in the tripos I teach algorithms to first-year students you can find my lectures here on the channel and I enjoy it very much but algorithms is not my research topic it's just a basic foundational thing that every computer scientist needs to know uh, and um, I teach the basics I don't teach the stuff that's at the frontier of research the area in which I come up with new ideas my professional specialism is, is computer security and privacy so if I were teaching a module in the master which currently I'm not uh, it would be something on security and you, you could then come and learn from me about my latest research interests and see if they're also your interests. Now, this would typically not be textbook stuff. It would be stuff that's a bit more advanced than what is in the textbooks because the textbooks have been written up on stuff that uh, uh, made the field in the past and has been then systematized into a textbook. Uh, whereas in the master's course, you could expect your professor to teach you stuff that hasn't yet been written up in textbook is something that new ideas that people just recently came up with uh, and they may have been uh, published in a paper presented the conference on and so on and in the future maybe in in a few years time the new textbooks will speak about them too when they have you know passed the test of time but at the moment it's just fresh new cool stuff it's really the frontier of research so when you're faced with that type of new content, how can you tell if it's any good? Because anybody can you know, write a paper, say anything they like and speak at a conference. Uh, but which one of these things are the things that should be taught as you know, stuff everybody needs to know? Well, uh, that assessment is part of what you need to learn to do during your PhD. You know, which new ideas are worth it and which new, new ideas are rubbish? And this is a crucial skill to develop and it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental part of becoming a researcher. And we teach you the methods that lead to that uh, ability in the master's course. We 
teach you by example uh, we let you do some of it and we assess you on how to do it and we, we you know feedback cycle on how to figure out if something um, is valuable is a good idea uh, is worth pursuing um, is worth learning from someone else so it's really not the same as an undergraduate lecture where the material that's in the lecture is stuff that okay everybody agrees is stuff that should be taught it's in the textbooks and so on uh, in here is that in the graduate studies it's more um, more a seminar than a lecture I should say uh, and there's a, a much stronger critical element uh, that you need to refine and exercise okay so you're presented with material and then you have to say uh, is it good why is it not good why not uh, and uh, that's the same type of a critical ability that you will then have to apply to your own ideas when you get your own ideas that, that's original well is it really original did nobody uh, ever do anything similar to that um, mm, yes and so you have to be aware of what other people have done and be critical of what you come up with or new people new other 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 people new ideas that other people come up with so it's one one significant difference between the graduate studies and the undergraduate Another thing is that uh, while in the undergraduate course uh, your path is charted largely by us, at least in the first, uh, the initial uh, few years, uh, here you get to choose uh, any courses you like. You have total free, almost total freedom to pick the modules and um, create your own curriculum. Nothing is compulsory. Uh, but with that comes a warning you shouldn't really treat it like you know go to the restaurant and uh, eat as much as you like for a fixed price and you, you just pick uh, all the stuff that's around whatever takes your fancy it, it, it's not smart to just select modules on the basis that they sound cool it, it's much better to have a coherent plan this year is supposed to be preparation for research you should decide the direction you want your research to go in and you should pick modules that support research in that particular area because the field of computer science is too broad to want to do a bit of everything you have to start specializing at that point in this year of uh, part three or master's course you also get to write a dissertation uh, you already wrote a dissertation in uh, at the end of your BA uh, and this is similar in that sense but it's also different uh, because in the undergraduate dissertation we very strictly uh, advise you not to do research not to try things that we are not sure if they're going to work uh, because we want you to just show off your um, computer science skills on a problem that we know can be solved now here uh, at graduate level uh, you can uh, venture a little more into uncharted territory and do some things that we are not sure they're going to work uh, this is a stepping stone towards the PhD where the big thing is something that nobody could figure out how to do yet and you promise you're going to do uh, but we don't know if it can be done until you do it and so this is a kind of halfway house between the two styles so you will do uh, for your dissertation you will uh, attempt to solve a problem that has some element of novelty it should be something that uh, when someone sees you've done it they will be impressed not just because of the skills you demonstrate uh, but also because ah that's a, a solution that um, I'd never seen before to this interesting problem so that is uh, one more way in which this degree prepares you for what would be a career as as a researcher fourth point is what should you expect to get out of this course well the broad aim is that at the end of this uh, master in advanced computer science or part three you are in a better position to define what your PhD research will be like as I said you do this with the aim of doing a PhD later and at the end of this year uh, you will you will be more ready to start a PhD than if you started it after your BA because now you have some clue about what field you're interested in you've you've tried you've looked at it you have 
greater awareness of what other people have done in that field, uh, what are the problems that are still outstanding, which of these problems you would like to solve. You have some clue now why it hasn't been solved by others yet, because after all, if the problem is is something to which it would be useful to have a solution, then uh, why haven't people already found a solution? Well, now you know why, because you've, you've worked in that field for a year. Uh, and also you have some idea why you think you might be able to do something good about it. Maybe now uh, you can apply new technologies to this, this problem that were not uh, available or not current uh, when other people tried it. Or maybe you have some some new idea, some new method, something that inspired by some other field that you're going to um, going to apply to the problem to solve it with a new approach. And also you can, uh, to some extent, uh, assess uh, which ideas are good uh, and which ones are not good and why. Uh, and when you, you're presented with uh, the latest papers, then, uh, well, first of all, you, you are able to go and dig them out and find out where relevant papers could be. Um, and it's not something that just your supervisor gives you stuff to do. It's you go out and scout them out for yourself. And when you find something, then uh, you have enough scientific maturity that you can make an assessment, not simply whether it's an easy read, easy to understand or difficult to understand, but actually is the content sound? Uh, is it actually novel? Is it uh, innovative? Is it something that's uh, worth listening to or not? So at the end of this year, the point and the purpose is that you will be ready to do a PhD here with us in Cambridge or in any other of the top universities in the world. Uh, hopefully you will also have gained uh, a better feeling or idea of whether uh, it is really what you want to do or not, which is, as I said, a good way to invest the one year, uh, much better than starting the PhD on the off chance you might like it, uh, and then discovering halfway through that uh, you might not. Uh, because at least at the end of this year, you still get a master's degree at the end of the trial, whether you decide to pursue the PhD or not. And the fifth point is, okay, how do you actually get in? Uh, what do you need to do uh, to apply and be admitted? Well, as ever, um, in all these um, new um, applications for a place uh, at one of the top universities, whether you're actually admitted or not on the program does not depend really on the stuff that you do at application time. Uh, it rather depends on everything you have done in the years that lead up to the moment when you end up applying. So the short story is you need to have a track record of having been really good throughout. Places are limited and it's very competitive to get in. This degree is, as I said many times, a preparation for research. So we don't expect you to have done a lot of research before that, otherwise you wouldn't need the preparation. So don't worry if you don't have a long publication track record, because you're not expected to have one yet, you're not expected to have published anything. But we want to see that you have potential, okay? We look for evidence that you're exceptionally talented, uh, even among the people who already went to a good university, we want to select the, the cream, of those. So this typically means graduating with a first in computer science or uh, some very relevant related topic uh, from a good university. If you're coming from outside Cambridge, we'll want some more indicators of goodness and the more of these indicators you can provide, the better. Uh, obviously evidence of your programming competence, which you can give, for example, through uh, showing off your undergraduate project, uh, the stuff you did in your summer internships, and so on. You'll be asked to write a research proposal, which shows us how clued up you are about what you will be doing, what you want to be doing, uh, whether you can assess uh, what is worth doing and what is not worth doing. Uh, you need to choose a problem that is sufficiently novel and interesting that if you solve that problem, you'll be worth a master's degree. But also something that is doable in one year. So you have to strike a balance between those two. Not something that's 
so easy that you know, don't deserve a master for solving that, but not something that's so difficult that it would actually take a whole PhD. And figuring all this out requires you to have done a bit of background reading in the field. And uh, you have to become aware of what's easy, what's hard, what's already been done, what's useful, uh, what, what would people aspire uh, to have a new result. Uh, and, and it's a good thing if you start thinking about these things on your own. And the application process kind of forces you to think about those things ahead of time. And then, of course, we'll want reference letters and the usual stuff. If you are already at Cambridge and are going to go into the part three, then, well, we know you, we've seen you for three years, uh, and we know the kind of CS education you've got, because it's the one we provide. So essentially, all that we require is that you get a first in your part two. Don't worry about the rest. Writing a research proposal, choosing the modules you want to do, choosing a dissertation topic, choosing a supervisor, and so on. Uh, if you are currently doing part two at Cambridge, you can do all that later. To get in, just get a first. If you get a first in the Computer Science Stripus and you want to do part three, you'll get your place, it's guaranteed, without any further competition or evaluation or assessment. Just get the first. It's a very lightweight process for you. Whereas, if you come from outside, you'll have to compete for the available places and a, a good first-class e equivalent from a good university uh, and as much evidence as possible that you are suited for research in computer science. And here I'm talking simply, purely, about the academic side of admission. There's a, a whole different story about uh, the competition for getting paid to do this master, so the, the funding funding issue is a separate separate story. So once you get admitted, then you'll have to find out who's going to pay for it. If you pay for it for yourself, fine. If you want someone else to pay for it, then it's going to be uh, a, as part of the process. It's going to be another competition where you're ranked against the other people who qualify academically. That's another subject. So let's recapitulate. When uh, should you be doing part three? Well, that's very easy. When you're loving the computer science stripers that you're already doing, you're doing well in it, and you want to do a PhD later. When should you be doing the master in advanced computer science? When you're doing computer science in some other university, you are good at what you do, and you want to do a PhD later. When should you apply? Well, typically during the last year of your uh, BA degree. If you're doing part two, then during part two, because part three is technically an extension of your undergraduate degree. Whereas if you're coming from outside Cambridge for doing the master in ACS, you could also conceivably have a period of real world experience in between if you want it, which is not a bad thing. In fact, it may give you uh, more focus on, on what you do. So what is the application process like? It's the usual for any kind of university application. Show us evidence that you have the potential to succeed. Show us that you're good, that you can program, that you have some initial clue about what research entails. But don't overthink the application process. It's not how you fill in the paperwork that gets you in. It's what you achieved in your academic career up to that point. And that stuff, you can't make this up by writing uh, flourished wordings. So just forget the application form. Just work hard to get the best result you can uh, in this year before your application. Uh, and if you're already one of our students in the Computer Science Tripos at Cambridge, then the application process is very lightweight for you. Just tell us you want to do part three by the beginning of February and then get the first in part two. That's it. Good luck. I hope you found this video useful and that we'll see you in part three or in the master in due course. Please like, subscribe, continue to enjoy computer science and see you in the next video.